Pan the people it up. Let's talk about how Matt Rule was kind of a tyrant and also previewing the Panthers taking on the Atlanta Falcons. Bunch of Panthers posted Phil Perkins. Thanks for joining. All right, let's get right to it. Uh, apparently, Matt Rule literally lived up to his name, according to ESPN reporter Jeremy Fowler, who's kind of like the in-depth reporter to David Newton's surface-level reporter. Uh, Jeremy Fowler's got a lot of sources, clearly. He had a very long-form piece of the Carolina Panthers, something you don't see a lot in the national media, especially with ESPN, and, and, and unless Cam Newton was the quarterback. Um, and he kind of delves into exactly what went wrong with the Carolina Panthers, according to multiple sources with the team. Basically, Coles Notes version, Matt Rule just kind of got whatever he wanted. He was almost like that spoiled rich kid. And, you know, he you're at Walmart and mom says you can go to the toy section and they're just picking up random toys just because they wanted it. They got some Lego, a basketball net, even though they don't play basketball. They got, you know, a water gun, even though you live in Alaska and there is no water gun fights or anything like that. Just, just random shit, but you, you gave it to him anyways. Uh, because they just wouldn't stop crying, they wouldn't stop freaking out, and that basically seems to be what Matt Rule was like. According to the report, one source said that he worked alongside Scott Fitterer before they made any roster moves, and then you know went over to David Tepper and asked for the money. But then other sources saying that Matt Rule just kind of got whatever he wanted, he wore people out, and just got whatever he wanted because he just wouldn't stop. In the case of Sam Darnold, after he he worked so hard to get Teddy Bridgewater. The perfect quarterback, that's what he wanted, even though in that draft they had Justin Herbert, uh, which apparently Marty Herney loved. You know, after failing uh, failing with Teddy Bridgewater, Matt Rule would just talk about Darnold all the time. Darnold, 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 until Scott Fitter finally said, fine, fine. And then they went to David Tepper, who, according to the report, reluctantly signed the check and eventually would be pissed, furious. Uh, about that fifth-year option and why he paid this fifth-year option on a quarterback that had not proven anything in the NFL. And this year, last year, could have at least been a prove-it year. And then you sign him, kind of like what they're not going to do with Baker, most likely. Scott Fitterer will do the job. Because take a look at what he did under Matt Rule. Because you got to understand, the general manager is normally picked first. And that general manager then finds their head coach. And then they work together. This was the opposite. They retained Marty Herney to apparently show Matt Rule and David Tepper how the NFL works. And then eventually they let go of Marty Herney. And then they picked up a general manager in the vision of Matt Rule. So Matt Rule hi hi hires the guy to find him the players that he wants. But they might not see eye to eye on what a proper quarterback is, what a proper defensive back is, linebacker. You know what I mean? And so I'm... And just look at the moves that were made. The Sam Darnold, the Baker Mayfield, the Baker Mayfield that, hey, it's not just Matt Rule. A lot of people, including myself, thought that he could elevate this team. That just didn't happen. Uh, you know, the amount of Temple and Baylor guys who probably wouldn't make NFL rosters, as we've seen as they've been released and not picked up by other NFL squads. See, now that Matt Rule is out of the picture, you're seeing the moves that Scott Fitterer is making without a head coach that's not badgering him all over the place. He traded Christian McCaffrey, like, within a week of Matt Rule being gone. He traded away Robbie Anderson. And he and he's thinking about the future. He's not thinking about right now because that's, this, that's the mentality that Matt Rule was in. They failed on Teddy Bridgewater. So, oh, oh, damn, I need to get a quarterback right now. You know what? Let's get Sam Darnold for whatever reason. And then that failed. He's like, holy crap, I am on the literal hot seat ending to my third year. I need to get someone who can help me win now. He's not going to put... You know, he's not going to hitch his wagon on a rookie quarterback, you know, so they had to get a proven quarterback, which Baker was in a way compared to at least Sam Darnold. And so they made these immediate moves. That's that's why, you know, after they finished 3-0 and or started 3-0 and last year, they got Stephon Gilmore. They got C.J. Henderson. They let go of Dan Arnold because they were in a win-now mode type situation. And I think that happens when you're a frantic person like a Matt Rule. But you take a look at Scott Fitter, how chill that guy is. You know, I, I have a feeling that he's not looking at this team that just won one game right now uh, in the last couple of weeks and thinking, you know what? We should pick up Kareem Hunt. Yeah, 100%. We should pick up uh, Gusecki out of Miami. I, I don't think he's thinking like that. I think he's thinking about, all right, let's see what we got on the roster right now, evaluate that, and then release whatever we got at the moment to try to get as much draft capital as possible because I used so much draft capital to appease this tyrant of a head coach to get the quarterback that he wanted which was not in the draft, uh, it, it seems that, you know, uh, Matt Corral was a Ben McAdoo draft. Uh, it was something that he just needed, being the new offensive coordinator, he needed somebody who he felt that he could maybe download the offense onto. So I have some faith 
that Scott Fitterer knows what he's doing. According to this article, the way David Tepper works, you know, we all talk about how David Tepper has his fingerprints on everything, has his insight, which I think every owner probably does have. But the way David Tepper operated, according to this article, was that kind of like on Wall Street, you know, you have your finance experts and that's who you trust. When you're a super billionaire, you're a smart person, you surround yourself around experts. And he thought Marty Herney and Matt Rule knew what they were doing. At least when it comes to Matt Rule, he did not. So... That's why he was so pissed off about the Sam Darnold thing and the 50-year option. He's probably pissed off about Baker Mayfield. And so I think now that the actual NFL people are in the room, not just football, NFL, no more college guys, I think he's going to trust Scott Fitterer more than we give him credit for. And so whether it's finding the head coach, which I'm, obviously he's going to have a, a say in that in terms of Tepper, but in terms of you know what they're going to do in the draft, what they're doing right now before the trade deadline on Monday uh, or on Tuesday, I think Scott Fitter is going to have more power than we think. And I think that's an okay thing because, as I said, look at the things that he's done so far, whether it's trading Christian McCaffrey for a boatload of picks. Robert Quinn just got picked up by the Super Bowl aspiration Philadelphia Eagles. And I think they're just sending Chicago a fourth-round pick for an edge rusher, which in the grand scheme of things, way more important than a running back. And the Panthers got one, two, three, four draft picks. That's crazy. For a 27, 28-year-old, often injured running back for in an offense that he's not even going to be the focal point. So shout out to Scott Fitter making that happen. Line is November 1st. That is on Tuesday. And do I think the Panthers are going to make some more moves? I do think so. Uh, it kind of sucks because he's kind of been the focal point and the voice uh, in most, the, the loudest voice in support for interim head coach Steve Wilkes, and that's Shaq Thompson. Just his performance on the field. Like, he's getting outplayed, outshined by Frankie Louvu. You got young guys like Brandon Smith out of Penn State, the rookie. And, you know, he can be put into a role where he can learn live during games, not during practice. And then, you know, these are valuable lessons that he could learn. And, you know, I, I never like the fact that Shaq doesn't rap. He kind of just hit sticks. He's always hit stick, and it's annoying because he's been under the tutelage of Thomas Davis and Luke Keekley his first couple years in the NFL, so it's strange that he still can't tackle properly. Dante Jackson leaving. Uh, I think that the cornerback room, he just doesn't fit the mold, like the physical mold. And, and we saw uh, last week against Mike Evans, who did not score a touchdown. The defense did, in general, do a great job. You just look at a guy like Mike Evans, who's gigantic. He's up against... Dante Jackson, because I believe C.J. Henderson was out with a concussion, and then J.C. Horn is still out with the ribs. Um, and I say ribs, I mean, like, he's probably okay to play, but they're keeping on the sidelines, because, as I mentioned, they're not going to say it, but institutional tanking. Anyways, uh, just seeing that physical mismatch, I just don't think that's in the mold of a Scott Fitterer defense, a guy who comes from Seattle, and they, they want freaks of nature. That's why they got J.C. Horn, C.J. Henderson, uh, Keith Taylor, I think that's why they have guys like that on the team. And I think Dante could actually get you a good return. I think for Dante, you can probably get, yeah, like a third or fourth round pick. Now to this weekend's game. And this just goes to show how weird the NFC South is. So tonight, Thursday night, if the Tampa Bay Buccaneers lose to Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens and the Panthers beat the Falcons at the Mercedes-Benz Dome, whatever it's called, the the dome that has a Chick-fil-A that's never open on a Sunday, uh... The Panthers are in first place. The would have would be the three and five Panthers who trade away their best player and one of their offensive pieces, fire their head coach, would be in first place in the NFC South, a division with Tom Brady, albeit the skeleton of Tom Brady, but Tom Brady. So there's a lot riding on this game. And I hate to be that guy. I hate to be that guy. And there's been a lot of good feelings about this team. A lot. I I feel the same way. I feel the love towards Steve Wilkes, uh, towards PJ Walker. But it kind of reminds me of the love fest, the 10-day love fest we felt when Cam Newton came back last year and just blew everyone's minds against Arizona, which PJ Walker started that game. And eventually started against Washington, started against Miami, and... We wanted to recreate that good feeling for the rest of the year, thinking that, hey, you know what? We can make this happen. We got a spark. They got that spark from Steve Wilkes. Not exactly the new head coach bump that we expected against the Rams. We got the we got the rook we got the without the rookie, but we got, you know, the the four string quarterback uh bump in PJ Walker, getting all these good graces, you know, 
the most the, the most accurate passer in week seven, according to PFF. All this stuff out of PJ Walker. Great stories, you know, undrafted, XFL MVP, all these things. You know, leader in the in the locker room. We saw the great videos of Steve Wilkes with David Tepper handing him the ball. This is for you, brother. He's crying. Everyone's happy. They want to win him the job full time. But I I just uh I don't know. I think just uh, maybe maybe I'm just a traumatized fan and it was so such a bummer to see Cam Newton crash and burn like that in his return to Charlotte. Um I just feel like these, these this goodwill that the Panthers are getting right now from everybody is just setting them up for a heartbreaking loss against the Falcons. They're one of the best rushing teams in the NFL. Uh, right now they're ranked ninth total in offense. Defense ranked 32nd. So not great. So, but we know what happens when this Panthers team takes on a team that is run heavy. Like they, they got random guys in their backfield and Marcus Mariota, who according to that Jeremy Fowler report, the Panthers were into. But you know, you got a triple threat in the backfield right now with their running backs and Marcus. And we know what happens to our defense when they're up against the rush, a heavy rush team. Mind you, this is not the Dallas Cowboys. This is not the Cleveland Browns. And Derek Brown is playing out of his freaking mind. So they could probably disrupt that. Uh, and I think the I think the Falcons pass or attempt less passes than the Panthers. And so, you know, I think even if a guy like J.C. Horn isn't playing, um, I think the current crop of defensive backs could keep them in check. I think Kyle Pitts only has had one touchdown this year so far because this is such a run-heavy team. They're gonna try. They're gonna play hard, and I think that's what David Tepper wants to see out of Steve Wilkes' team. As I mentioned before, I don't see them losing by a lot. I just see them losing by a field goal or less. Uh, and I think still, I still think they're going to rally though. They're, it's going to be a hard fight because it's a divisional game, as we've seen. Panthers are two and zero in the division. Throw the records out the window. Use that cliche. But I just think they're probably going to split this series, and that's what I felt when I looked at the schedule the first time, uh, the placements and all that jazz. So I think they lose this one in Atlanta, and then they win when they come back to Charlotte. That's the weekend they're play. They're wearing the red, the black helmets. I'm pretty sure that's the weekend. I totally thought they're wearing it this weekend because it's Halloween and. The black helmets would just make sense. Let me know what you think. You think the Carolina Panthers are going to make some more moves before the trade deadline? Do you trust Scott Fitter at all after reading that article from Jeremy Fowler? And do you think the Panthers are going to be victorious against the Atlanta Falcons? Don't get mad at me, man. I think they're going to lose 28-25. to 25, But I think they'll then win at home. I said this before. Before the, pre-se- before the season started, they're going to split this series. Because I thought both these teams weren't good enough. Not one was way better than the other. So... Yeah, Panthers probably going to lose 28-25. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I hope I'm wrong because in the end, we all want everyone to win. I'm just, just it's a gut. It's a gut feeling. Uh, let me know. Panthers win, lose. Who else getting traded? See you Sunday night.